Hey everybody, welcome to We've Got Ward, a doof media podcast series where we dissect and discuss Wildbo. My name is Matt Freeman and this is my co-host and co-interviewer, Scott Daly. Hey Matt, we've got such a special episode today. I am so, so excited about this one, Matt, because in, in a few moments from now, from what you're listening to right now, we are going to be joined by the one and only... Wildbo himself is joining us on the show uh, to, to answer some of our burning questions about writing, about him, and of course about parahumans and Ward specifically. Uh, Matt, we recorded this interview, I think, what was it, like a, a couple weeks ago now? Yes, I don't remember. yes it was. Yeah, and I had such a great time uh, talking with him. It was it was actually before our final episode, so uh, <laughs> it's just it's it was it was weird. I was editing it today, and it's weird to go back and listen to before it was all over. I was still like the show hadn't ended yet, and I was getting to talk to Wildbo. It was an incredible experience. Yeah, I mean, I think I can honestly say it's something that I've been looking forward to for many years, mm. and man, it's it's great. We're so excited for everyone to get to listen to it, and um. I guess, I guess here it is. Hi, everybody. Welcome. We are very excited to say we've got Wildbo here to talk to us about Ward, about writing, and about life. Uh, we've been looking forward to this for a long time. Welcome to the show. Uh, how are you doing today, Wildbo? I'm doing great. Uh, thank you for having me on. Yeah. Well, thanks for your time. Yeah, yeah. We are we are so excited to, to get to talk to you. Um, it's been a, a crazy ride this last two and a half years following along with this book. So I'm glad to. You know. Um, you guys have been great contributors to uh, the community, and it's just it's great to engage with you, you know, face, well, not face to face, but <laughs> <laughs> microphone to microphone. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Cool. All right. Do you want to just get started? Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, yeah. So so the first question, and really, this is kind of the, the main question I wanted to ask, because I, I've been continually impressed by not just like your your writing, obviously, that's that's kind of the main most obvious thing to everyone, but I, I've been impressed by like your brainstorming capabilities. And I want to ask about your brainstorming process because I, I don't really understand how you do it. Honestly, like you create like tabletop games and like descriptions of, of interesting games inside your stories. And I've seen you like riff really inter like intricate, complex story ideas or character ideas just kind of off the cuff. So I was just wondering, like, do you have a, a structured approach behind this? And, you know, whether or not it's a structured approach, like what sorts of tools do you employ? Like what sorts of mental tools, concepts, frameworks, heuristics, you know, physical tools, do you use note cards, whiteboards, spreadsheets, like any, anything along these lines? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I'm guessing from the way you framed that, uh, you, you want the long complex answer, you know, oh, yes. I can give you the short. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, so there's no physical tools unless, you know, I'm putting it down on paper. Um, you know, like I'll have the uh, the documents for Weaver Dice or whichever th where I'll use like Google Docs, and that way I can like, you know, I can share it with people. But beyond that, you know, it's mostly uh, you know, I'll put a lot of thought into how I want to break things down uh, in advance, and then once I do, and once it makes sense to me, it's something I can pull from at very short notice. And sometimes that's really specific, like uh, when I'm working out, say, twelve subclassifications of Tinker. Or I can have like possible dispositions for a cape, like hero, villain, mercenary, uh, Aflister. And then when I do dive into those specifics, I like to make it so that it's, you know, the ideas that, that can be combined or play off one another. So like for those dispositions, I can have the believer who is, you know, the type of cape who focuses on ideology and working for a cause. And then you combine that with the hero and you get the activist. You combine that with the violent cape, you get the terrorist, uh, you know, you can combine it with the f list, you get the loon. And by having all those, you know, combinations and sub-varieties, you know, it keeps me from retreading the old ground and forces me to think of, uh, you know, ways that things can play together. And, you know, then you've got the, uh, you know, the simpler, broader classifications. And there's, you know, uh, when I was making a game 10 years ago, I made seven colors with a lot of qualities that I attached to each color. And if I need, if I want to make something like a power more interesting, I might think, okay, how can I make this more red? How can I make it more blue? Um, and then all of that is like, 
like well, all of it, like even the complex or the simpler ones, you know, they're very broadly applicable. And you can have something like uh, a terrorist or a villain in any setting, not just, you know, for capes, not just for worm and for word. And, uh, you know, so you can put that terrorist into a classroom with normal students and just have, you know, a very ide- ideologically driven, you know, boundary breaking child. Or you can have that in the science fiction universe. And just a question of figuring out what the ideology is and then, you know, going from there. So it's just like having a, it's just like having a backbone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's really fascinating. Um, I, I I'm, I'm like immediately mentally spinning off all kinds of like, oh, interesting. How can I incorporate this into into whatever? Um, you know, related to that question, mm-hmm. how, how do you keep track of of all the necessary details in um, in telling a you know these huge complex stories that you tell over you know a number of years in in most cases? Um, you know. A big part of it is that it's all interconnected. You know, um, mm. you know, once you know something like a character's power, you know, that power has a classification, and that classification tends to have a common element. Shakers come from environmental threats. Tinkers come from uh, triggers that have to do with time or the long passage of time. And that's a part of the person's background, which ties into their motivations, which ties into the role as hero and villain, and what ties into who they interact with. And, you know, um, I'm sure you've heard of the concept of the memory palace, but that is sort of like my memory palace. You know, everything sort of maps to everything else. I was say, so like the story itself is a memory palace for you? Pretty much. And, you know, um, beyond, like even one step removed from that, you know, every part of the story uh, I told at, when I was at a certain part or a point in my life. Uh, and then I, there were little hints and references that sort of, you know, come up where, you know, uh, I don't know, like back when I was writing the uh, the words, uh, oh, sorry, the uh, undersiders uh, breaking into the POT office back in Oak Ten of Worm. Uh, that that was at a point in my life where my nephew was born, and you know it was you know the middle of the night, and I was you know doing notes on the story, and I put in a random uh, fetus inside of uh, dragon's uh, mouth, <laughs> and you know, and that that's like that's. Uh, like a waypoint and that's something where i can always go back to like okay that's where i was in my life that's where what that maps to and that's what that maps to mm. oh, that's so cool so you so you leave yourself like little anchors in your story that's that's awesome yeah, yeah absolutely um you know all the numbers in the story uh like uh the names of the culture and vials are also like references to addresses and things near me that sort of thing you know cool. um and you know just to give a counter example while i'm talking about numbers you know, uh, I struggle with numbers uh, because they don't have that inter- interconnectivity. Um, and they can't be tied to the network and they can't be put in, in the uh, memory palace. So that's where, you know, I definitely struggle to keep track of the details and, you know, remember the numbers where the, and where they are in the story. Yeah, yeah. I guess you have to, like, borrow from Victoria's complex files on Cape. <laughs> yeah. <should> have <laughs> plenty of things. It, it's so crazy to me that the reason why I was so mistrustful of Dragon is because you had a nephew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, I'm fascinated by how, you know, how your sort of framework for brainstorming and thinking of new ideas is related to your, your way of keeping track of things. Um, yeah. Just like it's the intrinsic interconnectivity of, of, of a big complex story is actually a... Uh, a benefit and not a drawback it's, it sounds like is that fair yeah absolutely it's um you know i've remarked in the past uh in like past interviews and such um that you know it's all in my you know in my ram it's in mm-hmm. my random access memory you know um because i never put the story down until i'm done with it and i'm always thinking about what i'm writing next or what i just wrote then uh you know it's always just sort of up there in my head and i'm holding it up mm-hmm. you know makes sense yeah yeah um you know Speaking, speaking of, you know, what goes on in your head, like what fraction of time would you say goes into, you know, sitting in front of the computer writing versus this kind of brainstorming and world building? Um, world building gets the uh, treatment I was just talking about where, you know, I tend to put a fair amount of attention into the backbone and then I build off of that backbone. Um, Worm Impact had the benefit of, you know, 10 years of preparation, less so for Twig and then almost none for Word and for uh, Pale. Um, writing itself takes up the bulk of the time. It's, you know, having to weigh the different streams of the reader, like the ones who are binging versus those who are reading along uh, week to week. Um, trying to keep it, like, keep each part of it interesting and meaningful, 
uh, pacing out the character themes, uh, tying everything to the themes of the story itself. And that's where, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not a fast writer and it takes, uh, you know, time to get those chapters onto the page. Mm. Cool. Um, that's, that, that's interesting. You, you answered a question just now that I didn't even realize I had, which, which was, uh, do, do you pay attention to like, do you, basically you always seem to have the awareness of, okay, some people are going to be binging this in one sitting or, you know, a few sittings. Some people are going to be reading it week to week and, and those people have very different experiences. So based on what you just said, it sounds like you actually do keep track of, of what your different readers are going to experience. Yeah, I'm, I mean, there's that, you know, there's the uh, the triangle, which I talked to about in the uh, the word retrospective, you know, the author audience uh, text and how each side relates to, uh, you know, to one another. So you've got the author audience, the author text, the audience author, the audience text and so on. You know, um, and there's all that stuff that sort of always has to be sort of kept in mind and, you know, held in balance. You know, cool. uh, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Wow. That's, that's, that's like, I can't, I can't imagine like that. Uh, like you answered every one of those questions. Like my brain, I can barely remember what happened in the story <laughs> three weeks ago. And I spend so much time with it. I mean, I know you spend more, but like, yep. it's just crazy that, that, that like you can keep it all in there. Wow. Um, speaking of, I guess, I guess you've kind of sort of hinted at an answer to the question I had following up on this. Um, because I think, I think writing fiction serially like plays to your strengths as far as how you're um, how, how you organize information and connect information. But um, you, you've stated that you're changing things up going forward as in your like pale is going to be a much shorter story than your stories have been in the past. Um, and you might do a few more shorter stories after that one, but you're still going to be doing them serially. Do you, do you ever see yourself like trying another format, like a, a traditional novel or a screenplay or, or just another form of storytelling outside of this serialized model? Um, I, you know, I think it's my tendency to get frustrated with formulas and I think, mm-hmm. uh, you know, novels are very formulaic. Sure. Uh, and that's where, like, I like having a story that sprawls and it explodes and, you know, you can explore it and go all these different places. Um, I, I think if I were to do something, it would be something like a screenplay for maybe a horror film, uh, you know, mm-hmm. like a, a, maybe even a short film. You know, I, I'm drawn to, you know, that genre particularly because it's, something that is very formulaic, but there is so much room to explore and to break out or to, you know, do new things within it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so taking something like a, a packed thing and, uh, like, just having an isolated monster and putting that on a screen and then you know, toying with the formula and with expectations could be really fun. Yeah, I love that. I love that. You just, like, I mean, there's so... That universe is so rich for just one-off tales about some people encountering a monster and what that would be like i think that sounds fascinating yeah Yeah, or cursed items or whichever else yeah for sure yeah yeah absolutely yeah that's that's i mean pact is always the one that i have the easiest time visualizing i suppose just first of all because it's in a uh a modern setting um so you you don't have to imagine a lot of excessive Mm -hmm. details but yeah that, that would definitely lend itself to a screenplay for sure but you could you could even like like it is a modern setting and you could do it modern, but you could you don't have to do it modern, right? Like you could do it. You could set it in the past. You could set it in the future, but still within the rules of this universe and do really interesting things with it. Yeah, for sure. Like uh, I wrote one thing about the uh, the milkmaid as sort of a word of God type thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was, you know, it was a light, a day in the life of, you know, your standard horror film monster and like how they would you know go about things and how they would, you know take the steps necessary to, you know, make the eventual halt, the, the, sorry, the eventual haunt or hunts, uh, successful, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And I would, just, I, that would be fun to do just to show the, the life of a horror monster and then actually, you know, sell the horror aspect of it. And, you know, contrary to the, uh, you know, the general sentiment that, you know, he's supposed to not show the horror film monster, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, like challenging that idea. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that. Yeah, yeah. that's really yeah. cool. Break all the rules to to make something new. That's fun. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a a big tangent from what we were talking about, but um, you you mentioned that you don't really use like um, mental imagery, visual imagery, um, very much, or you don't you don't rely on it. Um, uh, so, do you think like while you're writing, do you think about the fact that different people have different degrees of visual 
imagination? Uh, I do think about it, but it, it takes effort. You know, um, mm-hmm. speaking for myself, I can't really uh, visualize things. You know, and in your Discord, at one point I was asking, or I was asking the crowd, I guess, um, you know, whether people could imagine a white rectangle in their heads. And I can't. For me, it's very, you know, faint and spotty, and there's like, like, like it's behind uh, two layers of television static, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so when it comes to, uh, you know, actually sitting down and writing, it sort of trips me up on uh, two fronts, kind of. If I can visualize something clearly, clearly in the midst of the writing, I think my instinct is that, uh, that readers can too. And I've learned that's not the case. And that's mm-hmm. where the, uh, the positioning of some of the fight scenes can be spotty because uh, I assume people get it and then they don't. Mm-hmm. And I have to remind myself constantly that, that my readers are in the dark and, you know, uh, you know, I have to focus a lot on what I'm doing. Uh, and then you got descriptions and, you know, it's a little easier there because people tend to fill in the blanks with their own mental images, but, you know, you can mess up and, you know, not provide enough anchor points and then, you know, get people completely forgetting that, you know, crew is black or something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Or, or the number man wears pants. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I I know what you mean. I think I am very much not a, a visual reader, um, in that I just I I I think I can see the I can see the white square or rectangle, like I, I can see that, but much beyond that, it gets really messy for me, and a lot of it is just like mo- emotional anchoring to things. So I think it's interesting because I've never had like a geographic issue with your fight scenes, and maybe it's because I see it in the same way that you do where it's not like I don't have a a vision in my mind of the battlefield and where everyone's located and what's where. And, and if I'm moving to the left, that means I'm moving further away from this. Like, that's just not how my brain works either. So, um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And it's, uh, that's, you know, another one of those things which, you know, you constantly have to hold in balance is, you know, some readers are just not going to visualize things and not going to draw that mental map and know where things are. And you sort of have to, give them that little helping hand and then others re- other readers are and they'll get frustrated if you're walking them through things too much so right right yeah, yeah. It's, it's funny i feel like i can see a lot of victoria's fight scenes like a movie in my head but um taylor so much of of her of her story was via the bug sense that like my brain didn't turn that into a movie but i still understood what was happening you know mm-hmm. it's just mm-hmm. kind of fascinating how that works um mm-hmm. yeah so uh you seem to love words. <laughs> um you you do you you do all kinds of of like fascinating wordplay. Um you, I, like like so many double meanings in like the arc titles and in book titles. Um you know, very precise word choice. How do you go about this and 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 also why? <laughs> why? Um hmm. part of it is you know like uh you know you're spending 60 hours a week working in a certain medium. Uh, you know, you, you, you're constantly considering your sentences and the various meanings. And I think a lot of that is going to happen naturally. You know, you put a sentence down, you think about how it has two meanings, uh, and then you build off of that and, or you go back and you you like mix up prior stuff, play into those two meanings. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, cape names and those, uh, multi-layered titles can be like that where, you know, I'm searching through a thesaurus and there's a list of words uh, and I'll see something that works on multiple levels. Or I'll, I'll sound it out in my head and tweak the phrasing, you know, turn it from uh, a damsel of distress into a da- uh, sorry, damsel in distress to a damsel of distress. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and as to why, you know, I, I like it when that happens. You know, I li- it's satisfying to see things naturally emerge, you know, whether it's a storyline or a turn of word. Uh, it's uh, part of why I write, you know, just. Uh, because I like to be surprised by those little, you know, those little things that pop up that, you know, I didn't anticipate. And I think I enjoy those surprises as much as the reader does. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that because I think that's something I love so much about reading is just the way a writer can like convince you that something was planned this way from the beginning, but it doesn't always have to be that way it's just yeah. like you're going through your process and oh i found a connection here that i didn't anticipate but it works so well but from the perspective of someone absorbing it it just looks like no i i meant to do that from the beginning obviously <laughs> this was always going to be that way and it's like it's like magic kind of yeah totally totally all right so 
I think this is our last question talking about writing in general, and then we're going to we're going to dive into Ward itself, which I can't wait to do. But what what is uh, uh, the probably some of the most common misconceptions about writing or creating that that you see out there that you see people thinking about or maybe even that <laughs> Matt and I have said in the past um, that you just see people kind of spread and share that in your experience, it's just not just not the way things work. Um. You know, so soon off the back of Word, it's uh, it's tricky to get into, but I think it's the nature of uh, fan influence on the work. Um, and I'm not sure I want to dive into that too much because it's touchy ground. But you know, more generally, it's the uh, the shape of outside influences on the work, and you know, inspiration and the form that inspiration takes. It uh, it feels like it's the most off thing about how people tend to talk about other people's works. You know, I, a lot of interview questions will, you know, be like, what inspired this? Or, you know, what work, you know, drove this? And, you know, it's very rarely the one thing, you know. Um, mm-hmm. You know, all ideas, you know, that I have, they come from me. And that me is informed by the stuff I've consumed in aggregate. And, you know, mm-hmm. uh, I have to get out of my own way sometimes when it comes to figuring some, some of that stuff out. Um but you know, it's uh, it's hard to like say it's one thing. It's hard to say that you know it's one voice to one crowd that's actually making stuff happen. When it's more like the uh, the work has impacted me as a person, and then or the voice or the crowd have you know impacted me, and then I consider, and then I go from there. You know, so and I see people assigning blame, or I see people saying that's taken directly from that, and it, it's really the case. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah, I, I, that's, I mean, I, I'm not a writer, but as someone who consumes a lot of, I, I, I totally agree with that. Just that, like, we are, we are informed by, you know, every, every bit, every instance of our life, everything we hear, everything we see, but it all comes, it's all filtered through our own personal experiences. Yeah, both absolutely. In and out. Yeah. 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 Cool. That's, that sounds, I mean, I, I, I feel silly calling myself a, a writer in comparison to, to Wild Bill, but in, in, in my experience with <laughs> writing, it is it is like a, a process where everything goes in and it gets stirred up in a way where you can't really trace what caused what anymore. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, the stirred up, I, I've called it uh, steeping before, like thinking of tea, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. Great. All right, so let's talk some parahumans. Um so you you've talked before uh, in the past, I think you kind of talked in your retrospective and then also with Ruben and Elliot about how Ward as a storyline, as a story, didn't really click for you until you came up with s- the idea of centering, uh, centering it around Victoria and then around the wretch kind of around her, her interaction with what what ended up being the wretch. Could you could you talk a little bit about how much of where Ward went as a story, where it went from from beginning to end, was influenced by just kind of your character, like the character you created, and seeing where she went. Victoria being Victoria, or you had a you had a destination in mind, you had a place that you wanted to go, and it was just that Victoria so happened to be the perfect vessel to kind of get you there. Hmm. Um. So this is a tricky one. Um. You know, I think. I would make the distinction that it was less the destination that I wanted to get to and more that I had the ground floor that I wanted to work off of. Sure, um, sure. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I think I ha- when I have a story in mind, I tend to have, you know, the basic bullet points or the major things I want to do with the story uh, held in my head. And with uh, Ward, it was, you know, uh, I wanted to take the best parts or the parts I liked most out of Worm. And uh, put that in, you know, create a setting that worked with that and that worked, that made sense with how Worm left off. Um, and then, you know, from there, I had to figure out, like, okay, well, how is this going to, like, work on the more fundamental level? How is it going to be, like, what's going to drive it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so I was prepared to take that baseline of the city and its starting point and to go somewhere that would have felt natural. And if, you know, if the main character had been Ashley, I think that destination point could have been focused on themes of ruin, on contrast, maybe, uh, you know, probably similar themes to Victoria in terms of learning to deal with a part of yourself that isn't entirely stable or controllable. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think we saw a bit of that in the Eclipse arc. Sure. Um, if it had been centered on rain, I think we could have seen examination of past mistakes, 
maybe the XPRT would have come up more and looking at the how the PRT handled things back in the worm era. Um, I could see putting a member of the cluster inside the wardens to sort of tie out, tie into that. Hmm. Um, Wayne could have had, you know, focus on ideology and on beliefs and the politics of the new setting. Uh, you know, so I think, you know, there were places that the story could have gone and it would have felt just natural and fitting and maybe at the tail end, you know, somebody could have said, you know, well, that was naturally where it was going to go anyway. And how did you come to that destination? Um, but yeah, and I think, you know, the reason I didn't go with Ashley or I didn't go with Rain or I didn't go with Capricorn as main characters was that each of them did have, in, they did have uh, issues. And, you know, I'm sort of halfway expecting readers to jump into a chat and say like, oh, I like that idea more, but uh, <laughs> I don't think it would have, you know, worked out quite as nicely. Victoria, Victoria sort of, you know, once I had that scene in mind, of her with the uh, force field reaching out to touch the window. I just sort of, I knew like that's going to be something I can carry with me to the end of the story. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's really cool because like I, I loved Victoria as a choice and I loved Victoria's story through the book, but I, I see, although, you know, rain and Capricorn and Ashley were not, did not end up being your protagonists. I think it's still cool that you fit some of those elements in there. It was not the, it was not the primary drive of the story, but those elements, those, those motifs that you were just discussing were still featured in the story. And, and I think that's one cool thing about a 2 million word web serial is you, you have time to still fit those things in, even if yeah. it's not going to drive your main plot forward. Yeah, absolutely. I love, I love how having that, uh, elbow room, you know? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I find myself getting weirdly like offense, uh, like uh, offended at the thought of any other character than Victoria being the protagonist. <laughs> of the board. Um, She's wonderful. Yeah, we we love her, right? <laughs> She's so great. Um, I mean, I think related to that, I mean, you 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 broach the idea that at least it's conceivable that that different characters could have been protagonists. Do you have a favorite character in the Parahumans universe in, in terms of writing, like the? Uh, n not not in terms of like which one you like the most, but which one do you like to write the most? Hmm. That's that's tricky, and I, I'm not sure I could name one. You know, I think uh, what I most enjoy is uh, having a character like Rachel or Ashley as you know a unique voice that I don't have to work to make you know distinct from the uh, the rest of the cast. You know, they they uh, they're really fun. They tend to make characters in the orbit especially interesting because of how they bounce off of these. Uh, He's very uh, stubborn, I guess, walls, you know. But uh, at the same time, like, to say is my favorite character to write is very hard when, uh, you know, they are very they're very difficult characters to write from their perspective. And that's part of why I didn't write Damso as the main character was because she was just so stiff, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, would, I would probably say them. Cool. Yeah, I'm trying to imagine like what what a first person perspective of Ashley would have been <laughs> like. I, that's that's a that's a fascinating mind to be in um, from that first person perspective. Yeah, because I mean, even third person, you're still just a little further removed from them yeah. um, to where you like you can see like a, the stiffness. I definitely saw that. But just to really just be right up in there in her head. Yeah. Yeah. There's just this constant uh, difficulty where, you know, you've got to try to be a little bit witty uh, and a little bit like too full of yourself while still showing that vulnerability. And it's just a constant balance to strike. And, you know, yeah. she was, she was in the running to be the main character for a good while, but putting in a character that, you know, I brought back from the dead just to be the main character felt a little, you know, ill conceived. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, you know, trying to strike that voice, especially was, you know, it was exhausting for just a few chapters and I can't imagine doing 2 million words of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 Instead, you just wrote like a whole book over the course of a week in the Eclipse arc. <laughs> yeah. <It's fun>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, pe I think people do love those iconoclastic characters like like Rachel and, and like Ashley, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I get that. Um, awesome. Um, do you, so I, I'm going to turn your favorite question back on you, Wild Bo. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, it's time. <laughs> who's your favorite Parahumans character who most people wouldn't put in their top 10? Mm hmm. I would probably say it would have to be one of the uh, the F-listers, you know, the uh, those capes that are bottom tier with no reputation, you know, uh, not so much uh, Skidmark, but someone like, you know, Etna or Torso. 
<laughs> I, I, I have a soft spot for underdogs, you know. And, you know, when I wrote Damsel and then she died almost immediately after, uh, I sort of, you know, I felt frustrated because I, I like that kind of character. I feel like I could take them, you know, I could do a small short story about them and that would be fun. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool. See, this is this is why I love writing, because like you you just said, I had this character and then she she died after and I was frustrated because I liked them. And like part of my head is like, well, you decided to kill him. <laughs> but, yeah. but then but then another part of my head is like, well, no, you didn't really like the story. That's where the story felt like it was going. And that's what fascinates me about the craft. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, uh, I think it's George R. R. Martin that talks about, you know, being a gardener, or being an architect. And, you know, I'm very much a gardener, so I like to plant that seed and let the story, you know, or let, let it grow and let the story mm-hmm. evolve. And, you know, so, yeah, the story did kind of kill her and it's you know, <laughs> done. Yeah. Cool. All right. I'm going to ask the question that I think everyone wants me to ask. I, I don't know. I don't know how happy I am asking this question, but I am a little curious. So how early on in your planning process did you decide that Taylor either couldn't or just would not appear in the story what and and was there ever a temptation to reverse that decision during the process of your writing you know, uh, i think i knew going in you know there's an aspect to it where you know i spent two years and three months months in her head you mm-hmm. know and you know she's been explored and you know that's you know it would be a bit of a fan nod but you know she had a firm ending you know she's gone she's buried so you know yeah <laughs> Oh, she's oh she's she's buried. You said she's buried. Yeah, it, in a figurative sense. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not a literal sense, though. All right. Anyway, um, <laughs> sure, sure, Matt, sure. sure. Yeah, Just, yeah. Um, being very silent here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, my my audio would have cut out if you had said anything different, and I wouldn't have yeah, heard that, it. So um, yeah, that's that's how Matt's uh, Matt's audio. It's just just so finicky. You know? Yeah. 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 Um, you know. Um, so you, you've you've mentioned a couple times here the idea that like you could have gone with a whole different protagonist, but if we if we move into the story of, of Ward that we actually received, like were there any big could have beens? Were there any big like other other story directions or other character directions that you maybe considered and then rejected, like like you know possible character deaths or anything equivalent or similar to the dice rolling for the Leviathan fight where where you know forks were were available hmm. um i'm pretty happy overall that i covered all the bases that i wanted to cover um i didn't end up rolling any dice uh i think one thing i wanted to do was have the therapy feature more prominently but uh i, I was getting a lot of feedback early on that you know the uh the story was moving a little bit too slowly mm. and therapy you know is safe and it's healing and you know it gets in the way of the story and i I think if I'd gone on to explore that, you know, it would have, uh, you know, there would have been room to take each of the characters to that point where, you know, they did reach their climaxes, but not at the expense of saying like therapy doesn't work. And, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, like challenging them more, I think. And I think I would have, that would be interesting to see. And I think it could have gone to, uh, interesting places for each of those characters but that's that's hard to contextualize and like actually frame into a tidy answer here you know Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i i get that i i think like i think there's your book is in a lot of ways like about how freaking hard it is to get better and and I mean, even better is probably not the right word to use there. But I think it's just like I think you 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 set up for yourself such a high degree of difficulty in that, like sometimes it's just not satisfying to to like like uh, on the surface to watch the incremental, often pain in the ass process of just slowly growing to understand something to process something better um it's just you like you really challenge yourself here and i mean my opinion of course is that you pulled it off but i i I see like like that weighing that balance between like really focusing on the therapy really focusing on how just incremental and slow the process of of getting to acceptance it really is while also telling you trying to tell a story in which people punch each other and shoot lasers at each other yeah, you know, it, it would have been interesting to tell the story, you know, with the therapy some or the therapy sessions punctuating it. 
uh, mm-hmm. where like, you know, you constantly like went back to the session, but I think people would have gotten frustrated with like Victoria or with uh, Jessica or with the characters for, you know, constantly going back to the therapy and like them, them getting the right answers uh, or not getting the right answers as it may be. Um, and then, you know, just sort of like constantly struggling beyond that, even th- despite that. So yeah, it's, it's tricky and mm-hmm. I, it would be interesting to do, but yeah, had to do what I had to do. Yeah. 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 I, totally. I think it makes sense. I mean, I, I think, I think even just having the therapy there at the beginning of the story sort of set the tone and frame things in a way that, um, enabled people to sort of maybe make those connections on their own as the story progressed. Uh, that's my yeah. feeling. Yeah. And I still, I still think you did like, I, I obviously like each, each chapter, each arc was not capped by a therapy session, but I do think like, it felt like each major movement of the story introduced Victoria and a therapy session again. Um, they were not the prominent focus of the story, but they were, they were there. Like there's, there's lulls in the story as one crisis is dying down right before the other's building. And I feel like you plugged in the therapy in each one of those lulls. And I think that does at least communicate the message that she didn't like get this way all on the battlefield. Like it wasn't just being out there punching stuff that, that helped make Victoria better. I like that. Yes. Yeah. I like that sentiment very much. Cool. So, yeah. Uh, so I want to talk about Tattletale <laughs> because sure. the, 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 I've long said, and I think this remains true even here at the end of the, the book that the Lisa Victoria buddy cop segment was probably my absolute favorite part of the story. Um, it's just, it was just really fun. And I just really enjoyed the two characters bouncing off each other could you maybe talk for a little bit about how that came together like was tattletale's involvement in the story always going to be a thing just like predicated on the fact that she was involved with some of the the original moments of trauma for victoria at least the ones that occurred in ward um or was this something that just kind of you know just came up organically through the story because it's because it's great (laughs) um that that's one of the things that naturally emerged. Um, and I, I re- like, as I said, I really like it when things naturally emerge. Um, yeah. I, I put them together in the same space and I found that they bounced off each other in interesting ways. And then I felt compelled to keep going back to that. You know, um, it wasn't planned. And if I had planned it, I think it would have softened, uh, some of Tattletail's initial edges, uh, mm-hmm. while making it more of a challenge in other fronts, sort of like I talked about uh, earlier. Um, you know, just, take away that hard stance against Dwayne and make her more of an ongoing obstacle that needed negotiation, uh, like for Victoria to like constantly interact with the undersiders in some context and then, uh, you know, be forced to navigate that and have more of a steady growth and more of a natural evolution of their relationship, so to speak. Gotcha. You know? Gotcha. Yeah. But I'm pretty happy yep. with how it, how it turned out. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's wonderful, but yeah, I, mean, I, I think I see what you mean that the, the first the first time Victoria interacts with the undersiders and Tattletail specifically, you had not yet like really th- thought through, okay, they're going to go through a thing. The two of these characters are yeah. going to go through the ringer with each other. Yeah. That's not something that happened until a little bit later. And so, so she, yeah, I mean, she was pretty, she was pretty brutal to our, to our best boy rain there for a bit. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 No, it's, I mean, it's interesting because I don't, I don't remember at what point, I was like, oh, I, I, I want them to be friends. I think it was during Black. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, but yeah. but but yeah. I, that very suddenly, I was like, oh, they, I, I love, I love them together. You know, <laughs> um, yeah. No, that, that's great. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, so, uh, were there any scenes in Ward or, or Worm? Really, I guess I'm, I'm curious about that. That were particularly hard to write emotionally. Um. Well, you mentioned Worm, and that, that that's thinking back a ways, but I think the, uh, you know, the, the chapters where she's dealing with school, I think, you know, that touches back on some of my past experiences. And, you know, I think I got, you know, pretty emotional while I was writing them, you know, just trying to, you know, like feeling the emotion in me and then putting that into the keyboard and putting it on the page. Um, in Ward, I think, you know, Kenzie's chapter definitely uh, had me teary-eyed as I wrote it, you know. I think I did yeah. dig for that very emotional, lonely perspective to write her. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Dauntless's chapter, you know, just knowing what's coming and then just like giving it the gravity. And uh, those scenes where Victoria feels her past trauma and she finds herself, you know, at that metaphorical edge where she's telling Donal that she's made of these stray animals, rodents and bugs. 
And then uh, when she's unveiling the wretch before the readers at the very, very start. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, that's great. Yeah. I, I appreciate yeah. you answering that. I, it, I'm always just profoundly curious as to whether like, are the, are these moments that, that you're sort of like sitting there calculating or are they coming from the heart? And it sounds like they're, they're, they're very much coming from the heart. So those, cool. those scenes tend to be ones where I, you know, I think about them for a long, long time before I actually sit down to put them on the page. And then when I do sit down to put them on the page, I am tapping into that emotional space, but I have the background of, you know, all that prior thinking to give it that structure. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So why did you feel like now and by now, I mean, two and a half years ago <laughs> was mm -hmm. was the right time to return to this world, to return to parahumans? Was it was it I, I know in your retrospective, you ch talked about the challenge of writing a sequel and that being something you really wanted to explore. Was that really the impetus for saying this is going to be my next story? Or was this always kind of a world that you thought, oh, I really want to go back there? I really feel like there are more not just stories, but epic stories to be told in this world. Um, you know, I think if I hadn't, I might have ended up waiting for another, you know, three, four, five, six years before I actually did sit down to write it. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's a general feeling of, you know, connection that the readership has to the story. If I waited too long, then people would forget about it or they, you know, disconnect it from or disconnect from it more. Um and then I would feel, as a result, you know, compelled to situate it later in the timeline. You know, so, you know, maybe 10 or 20 years ahead with various characters, you know, further along in the journeys or dead sure. or whichever, you know. Sure. And you do not have to answer this, but okay. do you do you see yourself going back to this world ever again? Or do you feel like feel like you, you you're good? No, uh, I could see myself, you know, re revisiting it. If I get an idea and I feel connected to that idea, you know, um, but as it stands, you know, it would be, it would have to be a very good idea and it would have to feel very fleshed out. You know, if I were to, you know, continue on, uh, I'm much more likely to, uh, you know, like I can consider word a capstone, but then maybe to revisit it, uh, instead of continuing to go into the middle of it and, you know, fill out t stories from the time skip or fill out the world from, you know, other countries. And that, gotcha. that could be fun to do. Gotcha. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I agree that that would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My brain is exploding right now. <laughs> um, so much has been, there's been a lot of talk throughout the course of this book about the way in which Amy is depicted in Ward versus the way she behaves in Worm. My, my personal opinion is, that by the time we've gotten to the end of the story, I thought you did a pretty great job of kind of explaining how the character we saw at the end of one book um, either was always or um, through some horrible events starts acting more and more like the character that uh, that we see in Ward. But I was wondering if you could talk about like your approach to this character when you when you sat down to write the story. I know like once you settle on Victoria, like Amy becomes like a thing that you have to address in some way, kind of, um, were, were you, I, I guess my question is, were you happy with the way Amy was perceived in all the years leading up to Ward? And was there an intentional desire here to kind of write those perceptions? Or was this kind of just like, this is just the way you always saw the character. And this was just an evolution of where that character was going to go. Hmm. So this is a pretty heavy one, but it's, yes, uh, sorry. yes, no, oh, no worries. Um, yeah, I, I think I was largely, uh, I was ignorant about what the readership was thinking and doing in the years leading up to Ward. You know, um, you know uh, I saw some Amy apologism, I guess I would call it, but, uh, you know, a lot of people in my close circle, you know, prior to, you know, my current hangouts, it was fellow writers and some of my uh, moderators. Um, and they seemed to get what had ha what I had been intending, what had happened in mm -hmm. Worm. Um, and then, you know, I would later find out that, you know, there's a whole like sea of fan fiction, which is, you know, supporting Amy and making her sympathetic and making her the main character. And, you know, people in that uh, section of the fandom has definitely, you know, taken that stance. And I was, you know, kind of caught flat-footed by that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wrote those sections of the story touching on it and people, uh, they weren't, you know, they weren't just not getting it, 
but they were actively resi- resisting the idea or, you know, uh, sure, excusing, sure, sure. like, or even, you know, like saying, okay, I get what, ha- what happened and I like it or I, uh, I'm excusing it. And that's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that, that's hard not to push back against, you know, yeah. um, it's, uh, you know, Amy has, like, in terms of who, whether, she, whether or the current Amy tie, connected to the past Amy, I think she's always been a character that's, that's driven by faith and by feeling and not so much by uh, facts. And that's why she resists the undersiders and it's why she acts in the way she does. And I think that's always been her. I think that stays consistent. Uh, how she acts in word is uh, largely a result of the same, you know, mindset. And it's also the result of having an, an uh, inverted Carol relationship in her life. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so it's kind of an Amy that would have, uh, how she would have been if things had been different back in Brockton Bay. And uh, all of the underlying problems and sentiments are still, you know, still there and still tying back. I do think, you know, I pushed back too hard because I wanted, you know, I wanted the redo reaction to people getting it and, mm-hmm. you know, connecting to Victoria and through that lens. And, you know, I was trying to elicit sympathy from the reader, but with, you know, some readers who, you know, took, took the reading that I hadn't expected, uh, you know, that, you know, my fault, but I think that was a cause that was, you know, it was doomed to fail before it started. And by trying, I maybe ended up hurting the work more than moving anybody's position on the matter. And that's, you know, bit of a shame sure, sure. yeah are, are you i guess happy with the way the the, the story leaves her though um we kind of see her going off into the the east <laughs> um and to hopefully maybe start taking steps towards getting better uh i'm pretty happy with it i, I think you know one thing that i wanted to do was not have each character have that you know neat and tidy character arc you know sure. that goes like from you know that has that curve you know, where it reaches the climax and then comes to a neat resolution and things end up happily. And each character sort of is at a different point in their journey, you know, when the story finishes. And, you know, to me, that feels more natural. Yeah. I think Amy is, she. I think she has a hard road ahead of her. And I think I am content with her doing what essentially the... Uh, the epilogue is about and breaking the cycle, uh, breaking the cycle and, you know, getting away from her bad, her bad habits and bad mentalities. So yeah. I think she can go somewhere good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really, I really loved how the book, um, like she was o- always a presence in it, of course, because, because of how could she not be when your protagonist is Victoria? But I just, I really loved the ways in which the book, never really made Victoria's progress have to go through her. Um, yeah. I, I like I, I, the, the, the moment of acceptance in Victoria's life comes at a point where Amy's not in the story and she's not, not in, she hasn't been in the story for a while and she's not going to be in it again until the very, very end. And I, I really appreciated that. I thought that was great that, that like, I think there's probably a lot of desired when you have these two characters so connected by the awful thing one did to another to, to just to take that conflict and, and want to like hit them against each other a lot it, narratively. And I like that that was there, but it was not, that was not Victoria's story. Um, yeah. I, I, that. I think when I sat down to write word, I think I expected it to maybe be more of what you were talking about with the knocking together and the going through Amy. And, you know, as I was writing, I think, uh, you know, I started to understand like, okay, this can't work and feel good. It can't feel right. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think I made adjustments toward the end. I think even up to the halfway point in the story, I thought like, okay, well, I'm going to show who Amy is and I'm going to show, you know, you know, her, you know, show the evolution of, you know, Victoria's healing and her healing and we'll get to the end and you know Amy will play a role in defeating the Titans and then as I went on it just like it just it did not feel like it should happen and it felt like it would have been you know insulting to Victoria and insulting to all of the allegories that Victoria is you know in terms of abuse and whatever else sure sure, sure. yeah I, <laughs> is I I mean that that moment that I mean like it's so funny that that comes from the moment where Amy says no to helping 
kind of comes from that idea of what you wanted to do. But it's also one of these wonderful moments that you construct because it's both completely understandable and kind of good because it's it symbolizes her recognizing something in herself yeah. but also we need help there's bad guys around and yeah. and like i love that like when you can't like it's a moment that you don't know if you should feel good or bad about it um and i i, I when i read love those moments where i'm uncertain about the way i should feel and i think like it's it's almost funny that you kind of not unintentionally kind of backed into a moment like that. Um, maybe yeah. unintentionally is the wrong word. Yeah. Uh, uh, I am happy with how that came together. I'm happy with that moment because, you know, I do like those gray moments where it's not black and white and where you can you know, like say, I, I, this is right, but I don't feel good about it. Or I, you know, I feel good about this, but it's not right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it does tie back to who Amy is and what her central crisis was in Worm, you know, where she was the healer and she was being asked to help and it was unhealthy for her. So it does end up tying her character arc together. And I'm, I'm pretty happy sure. with that. Yeah. 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 yeah you know, I, I feel I feel like every scene where those two characters are, are in the same room would just like make my stomach churn with with like anxiety. And, and um, um, I mean, in, in, like in, in the best way. Right. Like, like it, it, yeah. it was always so intense and. Um, I think it, in, in a sense, it's, it's good that there was only so much of that in the story because it, it could have become like, oh, this is just, this is just too much for my, you know, I'm getting ulcers type, type, <laughs> uh, type reading experience. I, I, I thought it was a great balance personally. Yeah. It would be hard to write too. I think, you know, just from that, you know, stomach turning perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, in, in one of our final episodes, I think at the conclusion of the story, we kind of talked about. I, I kind of stumbled. I actually didn't write any of it down. I just kind of stumbled on this idea that a lot of the conclusion of the the politics of the world in Ward seemed allegorical, intentionally or not, to some of our own ongoing political crisis in our world. And I know, like everyone, I think most of the people that that read the story or the people that I interact with, at least, the election of twenty sixteen in the United States weighed pretty heavily on all of us. Mm -hmm. Was was it intentional to make? illusions like that or is that just something that kind of came out of just where your mind's at and in, in a world post 2016 hmm. no um I, I think i was definitely thinking about some of those illusions when i was writing the uh the arc with the fallen uh mm -hmm. but not so much with the later arcs you know uh 2016 was pretty disheartening for me um you know and as was the response to it from people in my orbit um and then uh, the fallen were sort of my attempts to, as many things are in the story, I think, uh, to draw analogs or to, uh, you know, process through the writing, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm writing as I'm like, I'm writing constantly and I'm always thinking about the writing. And so if there's something that I'm thinking about over the course of months or weeks or, you know, whichever else, it's, uh, you know, it's going to be something that comes into the story in some fashion. Mm -hmm. Um, so those analogs could have been, you know, some, of the, some people, you know, acting monstrous, you know, like some of the fallen dead and some acting like Miss Sims, you know, that old woman who's caught on the fringes of that scary movement. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so that was more of an intentional choice, like to put that in there. Uh, and then moving to the final part of the story, I think it was less about politics and more about, you know, our world as a whole. You know, sure. and politics impact that, but it's, it's really its own thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, right now it may feel like an awful lot of things are at stake and people just aren't making good decisions out there. And then, you know, you got the amount of misinformation flying around and you got the analog to teacher and, and you got the uh, sheer, you know, ugliness or petty objectives like Green's Cluster and, you know, sort of ties back to what I said about uh, inspiration and how, you know, the work comes from me and, you know, yeah. I, li I live in the world and then I draw out, you know, a fictional world where there's liable to be allegories. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I really liked that Matt said on that episode was this idea that the character of Caden is kind of like the talking points of, of people like, um, um, wow. I just blanked on his name. Who's the anti para human guy, Matt? Um, uh, Nieves. <laughs> yes, Gary Nieves. Thank you. Are kind of like the people that 
take his points and regurgitate them ad nauseum in in a kind of ch- childish but also ignorant kind of way. Um, and I, like I encounter people like that in my life all the time, and I really liked it that Matt pointed that out. So that's what really kind of sent me down this path. I, I mean, I love that like your your work. Like at the end of the day, this is an optimistic view of the world. Like you have you have created a story in which like there the belief is that when really pressed to it when really put against the wall people will make the good choice um and i think that's like i I don't know if if that's where you saw it going at the end of the story but that is like it especially in in the times we're living right now like we're, we're in the middle of this crazy pandemic and everyone's just sitting at home that's something that's really great to read like whether or not it accurately reflects the real world or not, it's it's a hopeful view that like, look, at the end of the day, things are things are going to be OK, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, know, uh, you know, as much as I write, you know, the, you know, the grim, dark, you know, uh, you know, high conflict stuff, you know, I think I am kind of an optimist in the end. Mm-hmm. I think I do have a generally good view of humanity. And, you know, I think that's where maybe that's coming through in the end of word. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. and I think I think I've all, I haven't read all your works. I've read three of them now. And I think there's there's moments of optimism at the at the conclusions of every single one of these stories. They do get dark. Yeah, absolutely. They, yeah. There's mo- there's moments of all is lost and hopelessness and and dour. Like, how could how could we possibly go on? But I, I do think when you reach the end of them and it's not just about catharsis, like you can do catharsis without optimism, but your endings are cathartic and optimistic. Um, Pact uh, uh, up until the end of this book, I think Pact is one of the most optimistic endings I've ever seen. Um, that it's basically like it, it like 100 percent. Yeah. 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 Cool. cool. All right. So maybe a simple question, maybe a very difficult question, but what parts of the, the story are you most proud of? Uh, it can be one part. It can be multiple parts. It can be just a, ge- a character, whatever. What are you most proud of and what you've accomplished in the story? Hmm. Uh, I think the characters, I think, uh, you know, when I think back, I'm, uh, I'm happiest with how I got into some of their heads and how they were much more fleshed out than I think they were in worm or even impact, you know, um, I like Victoria's journey, especially. I knew I was going to some uh, tricky territory with uh, someone dealing with trauma, and I'm pretty happy with how she found her way through it. You know, um, sometimes it was halting or with you know leaps forward, uh, but overall, I feel like it was pretty grounded, even if that ground was uh, at some point what the uh, the alien crater. You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it, I think it was essentially rooted in breakthrough and realization. And I know some people have complained about the compression of the uh, timeline and how much like how much character evolution happens over a relatively short few uh, short number of months. But uh, to me, I think uh, it feels pretty organic in terms of how it turned out and how as much as it feels like a short span of time. You know, I, I've known people who lived very hectic lives, who transformed over a few crucial weeks in a new context. Mm-hmm. And I feel like Victoria goes there. So I'm pretty happy with that. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder, like, and, and I don't I don't want to be critical of other people's opinions or anything, but like, I just that seems like if the only thing that's stopping you from enjoying a story is like changing two hours past to two weeks past. I just I don't know, like especially especially when it's a story that we're reading over the course of so much time like i know time within the story is truncated but i, I while it, it it both does and doesn't feel that way like it feels like three months past but it also feels like two years past because that's how long we were reading the story so i don't know like i, I yeah again, I, I don't want to be critical of what other people think but yeah I, I think there's a tendency to think like this should take longer or that you know you know this is only, you know, two weeks uh, and things can't possibly happen in two weeks. But I think, you know, all throughout human history, the, the most important moments and the important, uh, you know, turning points, you know, whether it was, you know, world wars or, you know, uh, you know, we brought up 20, 2016 earlier. I think, you know, many important things can be compressed into a fine point 
and a lot of decisions can be made and a lot of growth or, you know, uh, you know, broader narrative can, you know, happen within a very short period of time. So yeah. to me, it just feels like it makes sense that, you know, stuff would, you know, one event will lead to another. Yeah. yeah. Uh, to me, especially, especially in a world where everything's kind of escalated and elevated, like people are faster, stronger, like the, the, the highs are higher, the lows are lower. Yes. Um, every, everything's kind of expanded. And so you're going to see bigger, bigger swings, both negatively and positively than you would see in a, in a world without the existence of these powers. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, I think you employed a technique a couple of times or more than a couple of times throughout Worm and Ward where if it was clear that, uh, th that a character was going to be in stasis of some kind, then, then we simply skip that time. Like for Taylor, it was a long period of time. For Victoria, there was at least sure. once where we skip a couple of weeks, and um, and we see, we, you know, we catch up with these characters again. We see some things have changed. We see maybe some things very pointedly haven't changed. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I feel like that was a good way of, uh, at least for me, kind of highlighting the ways in which you know, hey, this isn't. It's not like there's you know massive shifts happening every day. So sometimes nothing changes for periods of time, and then and then the ball starts rolling again. That, that's kind of yeah, how I felt. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that ties into the uh, the compromises required, you know, because you want to tell an interesting story, but to you know have an interesting story that takes you know takes place over a year or over whichever has to necessarily include those moments of stasis, and sometimes that can't happen. So you have to find you know the middle ground or the compromise, or just accept that you know there won't be those moments sometimes. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And I still think the time skip was great, but I'm like the only one. <laughs> no, Scott, I agree. <laughs> Pretty much, yep. <laughs> I didn't even I didn't even realize that was a thing until after that episode came out, and I was like, "Wait, people don't like this? I thought it was excellent." No, I... Taylor Taylor <laughs> doesn't grow in two years. That's the that's that's see see. Yeah, I, um, I, I still hear about that every day. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah. Um. So um. So you know, me and Scott have talked about this story a little bit. Um, sometimes <laughs> just a little bit, and, just a little bit. And so, I think this is your opportunity, if you want, to to be like, "Hey, guys, how did you miss blank? <laughs> um, where where blank might be like some motif that you used, or or language, or or just I, I don't know, really any, anything that that we or or maybe um, maybe not the us readership. specifically, yeah, the, the readership, readership at large, yeah. just kind of whiffed on. Um, so there were things, um. But I don't want to like frame it as you missed it so much <laughs> as I failed to deliver it. Okay, so just to make that clear. Sure. But um, I templated some of the chapters and arcs after things like uh, the stages of recovery. And, uh, you know, there are things like Chevalier's interlude mapping to the, you know, the seven stages of grief. Where, you know, he had, you know, he had shock and anger uh, all the way down to the end. And that sort of like that was his interlude. Mm -hmm. um, and then Bonesaw's uh, interlude towards the end, uh, it gives the outline for the entire epilogue, as it happens, where, uh, you know, interludes map to the breaking of addictive uh, cycles. And she sort of tells Kenzie all about it. But, you know, you've got, uh, she, talk, she talks about the steps where you've got processing and you've got Chevalier doing that. And you've got fixing and you've got chastity doing that. Um, and then you've got the action of the leap of faith and you've got five doing that. Uh, and then maintenance, uh, set out right by Riley and her chapter is about maintenance. And then, uh, relapse is touched on with, uh, Kenzie and Byron in the, uh, the online chapter. Mm -hmm. And then the breaking of cycles with, uh, with Crystal. And, you know, she's, you know, breaking all the, uh, the, I guess the bad loops and whichever with, uh, with Carol and with, uh, Amy. And then at the end, you've got healing with Missy. And that was sort of the structure that I put into place. And I sort of sort of hope people would sort of catch that, but I failed to deliver it. So, eh. Well, now I got to reread the entire <laughs> epilogue right, I, right away. I, I think, I mean, speaking from my own position, I, I wasn't familiar enough with that, that I would have caught it. Yeah. But, um, but this, so that might explain maybe why people missed it. But I, yeah, I, I think it is interesting that I think people caught on to some of it. Like I remember Matt and I talking about maintenance a lot in that chapter. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, the, I think, I think people got bits and pieces of it, but just the mapping out of it over the course of the entire epilogue is where, is where I dropped the ball. So yeah, that's, 
That's yeah. wonderful. So, so she talks about that a bit, but no, for me, it was just a way of, you know, making each part of the epilogue about something and sort of telling a little bit more of a story. But I think I could have landed some of the bits better, like chastity or chastities and uh, maybe uh, the leap of faith on five spot. But, you know, I love this stuff, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is great. This is and great. and uh, you guys already know, but the uh, the pendulum or the uh, palindrome <laughs> style approach to uh, eclipse. Yeah, or, or the um, triptych. Still, more I'm, more precisely, the triptych, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm still so mad. I'm still so <laughs> like we walked right up to the edge of getting that, and we just didn't take yeah. the one final step to link uh, it all together. Yeah. Oh. That's so, right. it's so it's, good. It's, I love that. Yeah, it's like finding a trailhead and being like, oh, that's cool. And then just like <laughs> yeah. moving on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so I want to talk about Chris for a little bit. Uh, my favorite asshole. Um, Matt and I, I think, and, and I know we weren't alone in this, but Matt and I had an extremely optimistic view of Chris throughout the entire story. He was this little baby who just couldn't stop being a piece of shit. Um, and, and the book ends with him kind of miserable and alone in this cell, but there is like just a little crumb of hope with like Kenzie's 40th and 41st and 42nd and 85th, et cetera, extending of a, a choice that Kenzie is giving him. She's, she's giving him an olive branch continuously. Um, wh where do you see him in like five years? Like, do you, do you see him? Is he stuck? Is he just totally stuck or is that bread come of hope enough? Hmm. Um, I'm not sure there's like a very like satisfying succinct answer to this um, because sure. of who Chris is. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think there's a chance that he uh, he's either going to heal fully after a long, long period of uh, digesting, considering, or he's just going to go off the deep end. But uh, I think uh, he can't stay like he is just like by definition, because, you know, it's his hell in a way. He talks about how sure. you know, he's trapped behind the glass and always being observed. Um, and it's a hell of his own making. But, you know, um, he is going to get pushed to one extreme or the other. And just I think we would have to tell the rest of his story to actually get you know, like find out what it would be. Mm -hmm. Well, that's cool, though. It's It's definitely so this is this kind of middle ground he's hanging out in right now just no way no way that lasts That's yeah all. yeah I, cool. I i love i find that answer absolutely fascinating because it's like yeah um something really bad or something great but nothing in between <laughs> yeah <laughs> that doesn't surprise me when it comes to chris at all though yeah but i, I think that feels right you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so speaking of him a, a lot of people just have discussed and and some people i think have done a really great job of pointing out um, the ways in which Victoria's different facets are kind of so often reflected in some of the members of her team. And I'm curious where in that paradigm do you see Chris fitting, if if you even agree with that that concept at all? Oh, I, I do agree with it. It was kind of intentional. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we all have, you know, sides of ourselves that we have trouble mm -hmm. facing or contemplating. And Chris is in a way, he's the part of Vicky that's made of the strays and the cats and the rats and the cockroaches. Mm. And so the part of uh, he's the part of her that hates herself and he is someone who hates himself. And, you know, he wants to pull away so badly that he'll pull himself in two opposite directions to do it. And so Victoria definitely has that, too. And she fights it constantly with the struggles of the uh, with struggles with the wretch. Mm -hmm. And, you know. So as Chris, you know, as she comes to terms with that, you know, she can find herself, I guess, a way of dealing with Chris and a way of just, you know, being able to make a firm decision on him just as she has with herself. Mm -hmm. So so does his ultimate failure to come to acceptance reflect on that facet of Victoria in any way? I think so. Um, you know, it's about acceptance and he can't bring himself to accept it. And he can't, just as he can't come to a firm decision on his identity unless pushed to it. And like, even when he seems to, he abandons it. And, you know, she does, you know, she makes the active effort to find that part of herself in the searching through the warrior monk and the scholar and ultimately finding the self-love in the, uh, the crater of love. I don't know what bands have called it, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, yeah, the crater of love. That's perfect. Um, so what, I mean, 
what does uh, this is a completely out of left field question, so we can move on if you don't like it. But what does acceptance look like to Chris? Like if if he were to get to a place of acceptance, what would that even look like? Is he accepting like I mean, he's got he's he's a composite of so many different things as well. Um, I, I would just like I think each character like that does get to a place of acceptance has their own kind of source of it and their own framing of it. And I'm curious what his would even look like. Huh. That's an interesting question. It's never even crossed my mind. To be honest. <laughs> um, I can see a sub story for Chris where he finds someone uh, that he wants to be with that, uh, you know, because part of his joke is about lonely, loneliness and being independent and, you know, being isolated and so finding somebody that would motivate him and somebody that finds a particular form beautiful. Sure, and then, sure. you know, I, I think he can't be Chris and he needs to leave that behind. So he would find a monstrous form to adopt and a person to be with that, you know, pushes him to keep that form and pushes him past the point where he's dissatisfied with it and, you know, can return to being in love with it again. You know, uh, you know like you hear in relationships about how, you know, uh, in a long-term relationship, it's not about, you know, just, you know, uh, it's not about staying in love, but not falling out of love at the same time. And if he found the right person to help him love himself when he didn't love himself, then maybe that, that could be it and he could find it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great. I love that. Yeah. Beautiful. All right. Um, I want to talk about acceptance for a bit for sure. obvious reasons. Um, what is something that you learn to accept about yourself during the writing of the story? Hmm. Um, I think it comes down to self care. You know, um, I started word before I turned 35 and the, uh, the journey through the story saw me making that step from being, you know, being somebody that's closer to being 30 to being somebody that's closer to being 40. Mm-hmm. And, you know, at the tail end of the story, we have, you know, COVID. And I think that has a way of, you know, exaggerating all the uh, the worst uh, tendencies in each of us. And, you know, uh, many of Ward's characters struggle with themselves. And a lot of them work to find the uh, headspaces where they can be, you know, kind to themselves. And I think I am having to, you know, especially in the lens of, you know, current events, having to find that same sort of thing where I can, you know, be kind to myself and, you know, and that's taking the form of, you know, looking after my health and looking after my mental health and uh, learning to reach out and be honest about where I'm at. And it's, uh, you know, it's about, you know, finding the little things that, it, and, you know, uh, hmm. like I'm going to sound like an old man saying this, but, you know, stuff like <laughs> getting a good night's sleep or sitting in the sun and uh, doing really awful watercolor painting, uh, you know, just you know, the, the little things and how they matter. And I think over the course of word, I learned that. So, yeah. Awesome. Love it. Yeah. I, I just have to say that I think that your story has done something similar for me just as a reader, um, because uh, I, I don't know, I just seeing these characters basically be a good example, a, a positive example of the sorts of behaviors that that I should be embodying and maybe sometimes a bad example of the sorts of behaviors where I can recognize myself doing those things that I shouldn't be doing mm-hmm. and then look at that and say, you know, you use this as a, as a sort of gui- a system of guideposts. Um, that, that's, it's been really uh, very valuable to me uh, personally. So yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Oh, yeah. that, that, that's fantastic. And you know, that's sort of what we all hope for a story to do, isn't it? Like just to yeah. help us grow and learn yeah, I, sure. and I, I I love that you use the phrase "reach out" in your answer. Um, obviously, for how it connects back to the the original Victoria mantra, but also I think that is for me one of the things that I've most taken away from the story is that that willingness to reach out. I'm a type of person who has a very 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 difficult time talking to other people about the stuff that's going on with me, um, internally. I just, I, I am not good with that at all. Nobody in my family was really that good with that. We did not talk about that kind of stuff at all. Um, and I found that just like, it's not even like consciously, it's just like subconsciously being kind of surrounded by these characters all the time that are doing that constantly. They're doing that good work on themselves at times. Um, I think rubs off on you for sure. 
Yeah, um, for sure. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I, it's the same for me, you know, like, I think I went through all of my 20s, you know, being somebody that should have reached out and didn't. And, you know, uh, I think coming to the real, realization of what I needed to do partially through the lens of uh, writing word is definitely something that, you know, has helped me as a person. That's great. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Beautiful. Um, all right. I think we're moving to the the final kind of tranche of questions. Uh, and, you know, I, I think I, I, I am personally inspired by you as, as a person, just like what you've accomplished as a writer and creator and just a human being. And so I'm, I'm always curious to learn more about sort of like, what is, what is your life like? How, how do you make this work? And so the first question in terms of just, you know, the, the, the subheading of life questions is, um, <laughs> who do you admire? Uh, it, like, you know, for example, to make it maybe more concrete, who comes to mind when you think of the word successful? Hmm. I, I think the people who I find most uh, myself most in awe of are people with those uh, multifaceted talents. You know, um, having created, I know what goes into it. I know how just just how intensive it is to try and get something like a movie or TV show going. And I haven't been able to get one off the ground. But, you know, I've endured those months long back and forths and, you know, the struggles and the communication. So seeing somebody that can not only throw themselves into a creative field um, and, you know, do well for themselves, but also throw themselves into another creative field and then another uh, is, is stunning to me. And the example that's jumping to mind right now is uh, Donald Glover. You know, mm -hmm. um, he does music yeah. and he does TV and, you know, he does acting, he does directing. I think he does some writing as well. And it's just, you know, that's just stunning to me to have. I, I, I feel like it's genius, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then, like, even the, uh, you know, the actors who can also sing and dance. So, you know, the, uh, the multifaceted actors like uh, Saoirse Ronan or Gary Oldman, where, you know, I, I can forget that the person I've seen in a prior movie because they can disappear into something or they can, you know, dive into a completely different project. And I love that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's really interesting. So, so like a, a kind of heroic flexibility is how, what I would take away from that. That's a good way of putting it, yeah. Uh, so what is your, what does your morning routine look like? Uh, if, if whatever degree of detail you want to walk me through. Huh? Um, I'm not a morning person. So it's, <laughs> uh, so it's sleep, uh, sleep, more sleep. Um, you know, uh, I might wake up at, you know, 10 or 11 o'clock. Uh, I'm deaf. So I sleep with my hearing aids out. Uh, I have an alarm clock that shakes my bed to wake me up. Then I'll, you know, make tea, probably don't eat, don't usually eat breakfast. And then, you know, I sit down, get on the computer and, you know, I start going through the 50 plus emails or orange Reddit envelopes that I have. I, uh, <laughs> you know, I check the moderation on Discord to make sure that nothing's on fire. And, uh, you know, it tends to be pretty quiet. You know, um, I tend to have, like, just, I guess, to give, you know, an image of myself as a person, or an image, image of myself starting the day, you know, um, I have a tinnitus. It's a constant fire alarm type ringing in my ears. And it's not that bad when I'm mellow. So, you know, I'll start the day and it'll be a very quiet morning where I don't have anything like going on in the background. But then, you know, by early afternoon, it gets to that point where I'm putting on music and that music tends to set the tone of my day. And that drowns out the, uh, the ringing in my ears. And uh, often it'll reflect what I'm doing or what I'm, if I'm writing that day, it'll get me in the mood for a certain tone of chapter. And then, you know, yeah, go on, go on to my day from there. Cool. Awesome. I, I, I very much uh, relate to uh, just sleep, sleep, sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Feel I can't, I, I, the, the structure though is something like the idea that you can like get up and start your day and then go to check your, go to sit down at your computer and start checking. Like I, I literally roll out of bed and. I see if I have discord notifications and I'm like, uh Oh, what happened? Um, <laughs> uh -huh. So I wish I could like give myself some peace in the morning before I dive back into <laughs> that, but um, I can't do it. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll try to, maybe I'll try to limit that to sitting at my, I, my desktop when I do that. Mm -hmm. That's good. I mean, I mean, the gap is pretty fleeting. It's, you know, it's me getting up, I put down the tea and then, you know, I'm at my computer not that long after. So yeah, but that's, yeah. it's still a gap though. That's, that's <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. You're you're out of bed before you've looked at it, so yeah. Yes, so. yes. 
Uh, what books have you given as a gift most frequently? Uh, or what book in general would you say that you would insist that everybody read? Um, I remember you asking a similar question in the uh, Doof and Chill uh, Q&As. Mm-hmm. You know, um, or maybe somebody asked it of you and you got stuck on it. Um, yeah, it's, it's a sneakily hard question. It is. Um, I don't think I've ever, you know, like given that same book to more than one person. But, you know, I do remember sharing and recommending uh, We Need to Talk About Kevin you know, more than one uh, family member, you know, um, I read it on a trip to Europe and then I gave it to my brother and, uh, you know, he read it and then I, I just loved the discussion that we had about it. You know, it was actually a highlight of the trip. You know, you know, we went, you know, halfway across the European country, uh, European continent. And, uh, you know, that's one of my big takeaways. So that might say a lot about me in my headspace, you know? <laughs> That's funny. I didn't even know it was a book. So uh, my, my curiosity is peaked. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, so, I mean, I, I think you've mentioned before that you, you read a lot. You have an above average reading speed. I, I believe you've said that before. Um, anything you want to tell us about your reading habits, I'd appreciate he- hearing. Like how many books do you think you read per year? That kind of thing. You know, uh, a lot of the advice that they give to writers is that you should read a lot. And unfortunately, I don't. I'll do a lot, you know. Um, I find that when I'm in, in a position to read, I'll end up writing instead, you know. Uh, I mostly do my reading while I'm up at my cabin. And that's where I'll, you know, I'll bring a big bag a big bag full of books and then I'll tear through two to four books a day or for, for a weekend or for a week. But, uh, you know, because it's mostly when I'm there and I'm disconnected from everything, you know, uh, it depends very heavily on how often I get up there, you know? Um, so it could be, you know, six books that I read in a year, or it could be 30 at the extreme end. Mm-hmm. And, uh, a lot, a lot of those will end up being, you know, very light reads because they're books that I got for free that were passed on, like from one aunt to my mom, to me or something like that. So like a lot of, t- of, uh, detective fiction. Mm. Okay. Nice. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. That, I, 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 I emphasize with sort of having to, to find time for reading. I, I think uh, audiobooks are a godsend for me. I, I don't know the last time I read a book that was made out of paper. Um, all right. <laughs> so here, here's the, the high philosophical question. Uh, what do you think your 35-ish year old self would tell your 20-year-old self in terms of advice? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm, I'm 36, so I just have to pretty much think about what I'd ask my, or sure. what I tell my past self, but yeah. Mm. Hmm. I think I would tell the past me to, you know, step back and readjust that frame to, uh, think more about context. You know, you, you hear that quote about how we all judge ourselves by our intentions and circumstances, but then we judge others by their actions. And, you know, I wasn't very good at judging myself by my intentions and circumstances. I, you know, kicked myself for certain actions and I kicked myself for doing this or doing that. And it wasn't very forgiving, you know, of, you know, the me then. And I think I'm still working on that to some degree. But, you know, if I'd, if I'd thought more about context, I think I'd have realized there were more action or more answers right in front of my face where I would have been, would have been much happier in my 20s. You know, if I'd, you know, realized that there were people I needed to distance, distance myself from, or, you know, even just realizing that, hey, you know, the problem that you're having with, uh, you know, you know, with social situations because you're deaf, you know, that seems so blatant. But because I was so zoomed in, so focused on like my individual failures in those moments and not zooming out and looking at the context, you know, I was unnecessarily hard on myself. So, I, you know, I try to tell myself to clue in. But, mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's also easy to empathize with for me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, definitely. So what do you imagine that your 50 year old self will have to say to your 36 year old self? Hmm. Probably that I shouldn't be in uh, such a rush, you know, just in terms of work and, you know, getting the books out there and that sort of thing. You know, I think, you know, it, he would say to get out more and live life. And I say that because, you know, it's something I kick myself a bit for. Uh, not doing more in my 20s and you know my 20 year old self kicked my teenage self for not doing that as a teenager so I can imagine the trend continuing where you know I'm yeah just 
maybe not doing enough to get out there and live life because I'm so focused on the moments. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, making me feel very judged right now too. So, <laughs> so that's, uh, uh, good. I, gotcha. excuse me, I have to go. Um, no, yeah. um, <laughs> I have to go enjoy life. Yeah, it's not yeah. working all the time. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, f- so final question, uh, what are some common misconceptions about you? Hmm. I think, uh, being an online personality with a lot of, you know, very dark writing under my belt, it creates a very, uh, intimidating image. You know, I, uh, you know, I, I think as you may be able to, to, uh, tell from past answers I gave in this interview, you know, I, uh, I went from being a very anxious guy in my twenties, you know, to, to that, I made that leap to being an online personality. And I think that played into an, I played into that image, uh, you know, with, you know, comments and jokes about, uh, you know, like, I like it when my readers cry or you know, that sort of thing. Like, I, I just sort of like, I, I played that up just because it was a bit of a crutch. Mm-hmm. And then I'm only recently finding out that like some people took that dead seriously. And, you know, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm sort of having to escape that a bit, but like, I, I see people join, uh, you know, join chats and then they see me there and they, they are uh, starstruck or they're intimidated. And I'm just like, I'm not that evil. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm not. I'm not powerful. I'm not. You know, I'm not that talented. I'm just a guy. You know, I'm stumbling along the way. You know, I, you know, I only want to get that emotional reaction from people who are reading to have emotions, and that's mm-hmm. the extent of it. You know. Yeah. 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 I mean, being being an online personality is just a it's a weird thing, right? Like, I, like Matt and I have maybe one. 1% of, <laughs> of the, the community base that you have, um, maybe, but even we feel it sometimes like that you're, you're, you are to a certain extent, a personality and the person you put out there is not always exactly who you are. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think everyone, everyone holds a little bit back of who they are when they're communicating with other people, let alone when you're sitting in front of a microphone or, or for you sitting in front of a keyboard, um, so it's just kind of a, a weird, weird thing. Um, I, I've appreciated getting to know you as a, a writer, but then also as a person that I chat to on occasion. Um, cause I mean, I, those, I can see both, I can see you in both of those people, but I do see the ways in which those people are a little bit different. I, I thank you. And, uh, you know, I, I've appreciated getting to know you guys too. You know, it, it's been great and, you know, it's, uh, it is just such a tricky thing where, you know, I think we're all, you know, sometimes wearing different hats and we're all sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, we're doing, uh, you know, we're putting on roles or we're, you know, we're getting analyzed in very limited contexts and that can create maybe sometimes warped images, but, you know, yeah, I, yeah. you know, I, I appreciate, I appreciate that, you know, you got to know me and I appreciate that you, you know, uh, I appreciate getting to know you as well. I guess. So, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Great. Yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, I was a, a fan of worm long before I ever knew you as a person. And so it took me a bit of time to, uh, to process that the guy who wrote one of my <laughs> favorite things in the world is, you know, chatting, but yeah, you know, here I'm, I'm going to do a thing where I embarrass Matt right now thanks, because you thanks. know how much I love to do that. But <laughs> when, when Matt and I first, like when we first started, like podcasting. One of the things Matt and I said to each other was like, Hey, wouldn't it be cool to do interviews? And we were like, fuck yeah, let's do interviews. <laughs> and and then I think we both like opened up a Google doc and this is the way, this is the way both our brains work where we like shoot for the moon and then hope we get halfway there maybe. But we were like, all right, let's just write down like five people. We each would just like, would be our dream people to interview. Um, and one of Matt's five was you. And, and it's uh, like, it's, it's a, it's a crazy, crazy ride we've been on that Matt gets to cross one of those off his list. Yeah. It's incredible. Like, I don't think either of us ever, ever, ever thought that was going to happen. Um, and it's, it's been a real pleasure. It really has. Uh, thank you. Yeah. We really appreciate you, uh, giving us this opportunity. Um, this is, this is a lot of fun. I hope mm-hmm. everyone enjoys it. Um, I certainly enjoy doing it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, we, we can't re- wait to read pale. Um, I've, I'm already enjoyed the parts that I've seen. So we're so excited to see what you got next. Hey, yeah. well, thank you. And yeah, I'm looking forward to writing it. It's going to be uh, pretty interesting, I think. So yeah. Awesome. 
Thank you. Thank you for having me on. And that's all we got for you this week on Wildbow. <laughs> if you want to support the Doof Media podcasts like We've Got Ward, Pale Reflections, and Decomposing Worm, consider donating to our Patreon account at patreon.com slash doofmedia. We've got a bunch of fun rewards, so go check that out. And of course, while you are there, make sure you go over to Wildbow's Patreon at patreon.com slash wildbow and donate to him as well. The worlds of parahumans and Pact uh, are his, and we're all just playing in them. Yes, and, and thank you once again to Wildbow. That was an incredible experience. And... Um, folks we there's a lots of there's a lot of fun stuff going on like we were matt just talked about pale reflections and decomposing worm those are our two shows being led up by ruben and elliot on the pale reflection side and by clarence and matthias on the uh, decomposing worm side and uh, you guys got to listen to these shows we're not we're, you don't get to listen to us anymore <laughs> listen to them listen to them um decomposing worm premieres this friday the 22nd of may it's going to be out friday morning so you can listen to that on friday and then on saturday the new episode of pale reflections comes out so we've kind of turned it into like a wild bow weekend matt this is kind of this is what our schedule is now everybody's working for the wild bow weekend yeah yeah i mean i'm, I'm pretty happy that we've made this machine that now just creates <laughs> wild bow content and i just I, I, I just sit back and watch. Yeah, it's, it's it's incredible. And of course, please, please, please stay subscribed to this feed. We've got more stuff coming in the future. Probably not within the next week. You're probably next Wednesday. I'm sorry, we're not going to have anything new for you, but we do have more Weaver Dice coming. We've got some other stuff planned. So please stay subscribed to this feed. And, uh, and, and that's it. Listen to Decomposing Worm. Listen to Pale Reflections. And listen to all our other stuff. Listen to Kingslingers. Listen to the Doofcast. We've got so many shows. We've got a bunch of shows. Uh, you know, doofmedia.com. You can find all the shows if you're curious about that. Yep, yep, yep. Well, folks, that's it. Uh, thanks so much for coming with us on this journey. And stay tuned for more fun stuff from Doof Media. 